What I'm going to be talking about today is SARS-CoV-2 viral load. So SARS-CoV-2 viral load, dynamic shedding and infectiousness are critical factors for viral transmission. It's important for implementing strategies to control the COVID-19 pandemic, such as isolation and quarantine, and looks like it might be able to be useful for predicting disease severity. Um, so if you look at viral load, I'm going to go through some de definitions here. So viral load is the amount of virus in the infected person's sample, whether that be respiratory samples, blood or faeces. It's expressed as the number of viral particles within a fixed volume of, sam of sample. And high viral load usually means that the infection is progressing. So if you look on this right hand side, the individual is infected, the viral load increases to a peak usually just before on the onset of symptoms. And this is an infectious part that the individual is. And then the virus load drops as the individual recovers. Another term that's used is viral shedding. So this is the release of virus from the infected cells in your body, which is then shed into the environment. And it can be shed if you're singing loudly, sneezing, exhaling. It's also found in person's stool. So viral particles shed are typically infectious, but for COVID-19, the definition of shedding has been broadened to include shedding of genetic, viral genetic material, the RNA, which may or may not be infectious. So SARS-CoV-2 um, diagnosis, screening and surveillance relies on measuring viral RNA. And this is achieved by using an assay called RTQ-PCR, stands for, it's a mouthful, reverse transcriptase quantitative polymerase chain reaction. And this measures the number of copies of the viral genetic material that's present in the sample. So ideally the genetic material within the virion, but it could be um, debris and so on in the cells as well. Now, typically the region of the RNA that is amplified with primers within particular genes as shown here in the E or the N gene. And uh, the process or the um, assay detects a very small segment, as you can see, of the total viral RNA, really as a proxy for the presence of that full length RNA genome. So it is possible to amplify degraded RNA genome if the small um, segment you are amplifying is intact. So um, viral load measured by this process may or may not represent infectious virus. It really depends on the quality of the sample and if you've got intact or um, genome or not. So the gold standard for detecting infectious virus is cell culture. So this is showing you a monolayer of epithelial cells that have been derived from the kidney of an African green monkey. See a nice monolayer of cells. And typically what is done is that samples are taken and they're added to the cells. And if there's virus in that sample, the virus will enter the cells, reproduce, and then kill the cells. And what you'll see on the left-hand side is a characteristic cytopathic effect um, mediated by the virus. So here we show the relationship between viral load and infectivity. Um, using what's called the cycle threshold, which is the number of cycles of amplification needed to detect the viral RNA using the uh, PCR assay. And the lower the CT value, that means the higher the viral load. So there's an inverse relationship. And this graph, graph shows that um, the viral load, as the viral load increases, so does the probability of being able to culture infectious virus from the sample. Now, a more accurate measure of viral load compared to using CT is converting the CT value into copies per mil, uh, which can be done if you've got a calibration curve of known amounts of RNA, viral RNA. So some studies have shown that viral load of greater than 10 million RNA copies per mil is associated with being able to culture infectious virus, while viral loads of um, less than 1 million RNA copies per mil, um, you rarely are able to detect infectious virus. Um, so this might suggest that you could have a cutoff for um, inferring infectious virus. And I should add that these data were from individuals who are symptomatic and usually hospitalised patients and would have to be confirmed in individuals who are asymptomatic, as well as further studies. So now I'm going to give you an update on SARS-CoV-2 viral dynamics uh, versus the, the uh, viral load of SARS and MERS. 
And this is really on the back of a recently published systematic review and meta-analysis of 79 samples with over 5,000 individuals um, analysed that had SARS-CoV-2. And these um, papers were published from January to June of this year. So they found that peak SARS-CoV-2 viral load in the upper respiratory tract was observed in the first week of illness at the time of symptom onset or during the prodromal stage. And this, uh, this um, um, compares with, or in contrast with SARS and MERS where the peaks are later um, in the infection process, as you can see on this graph. They also found that peak SARS-CoV-2 viral load appears later in the lower respiratory tract versus the upper respiratory tract. None of the studies identified a pre-symptomatic viral load peak, which was previously predicted by modeling studies. Similar viral load was observed at the start of infection in asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals. And um, there was faster clearance of virus in asymptomatic individuals. So one of the main conclusions of this study is that highest transmission risk occurs very early in the disease course for SARS-CoV-2 spanning a few days before and within five days of symptom onset. And this is consistent with data uh, that's come out of contact tracing. The study also looked at viral shedding and infectiousness. And they found the mean duration of SARS-CoV-2 RNA shedding um, are as follows in the upper respiratory tract, lower uh, respiratory tract stool and serum of about an average of 14 to 17 days. I should note that in the stool, the role um, in transmission of this shedding is unknown, but, and is not thought to be a major contributor to transmission. They also found that RNA shedding duration is associated with age. The older you are, um, the longer you shed the virus, as well as if you're a male, you'll shed the virus longer. Now, despite maximum duration of RNA shedding of up to 83 days in the upper respiratory tract, the really important message here is that no study detected live virus beyond day nine of illness, even in the presence of persistently high viral loads. So what does that mean? So the presence of viral RNA in samples does not necessarily correlate with infectivity, especially following symptom resolution. Isolation timelines reflecting viral dynamics could be counted from symptom onset for days 10 um, in patients with non-severe disease and consistent with guidelines that repeat testing is no longer required to, do, to determine if an individual is no longer infectious provided there has been clinical resolution or improvement. So I'm just gonna now um, switch to disease severity. And some studies have shown that higher SARS-CoV-2 viral load and or longer duration of viral shedding in respiratory samples is observed in individuals with more severe cases of COVID-19 disease. And a study that was recently published in Nature Communication showed that the presence of detectable viral RNA in the blood, so we're talking now about viremia, is more common in severe disease and may be indicative of disease severity. So they found that in 88 individuals hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2, 44% on a ventilator, ventilator had viremia, viremia versus 19% on supplemental oxygen and versus none on no oxygen. So there is a, a relationship between being able to detect viremia and increase in disease severity. Another study showed that blood viral loads are positively associated with systemic hyperinflammation, which is a key feature of severe COVID-19. So it may um, appear that um, if you can detect virus in the blood, that's not a good sign with respect to disease and, and uh, disease severity. And with that, thank you for your attention.